Would you join in our responsive call to worship? I will give you thanks with my whole heart, O God. I will stand before you and sing praises to your holy name. For your steadfast love and faithfulness has surrounded me all my days, and I have known the security of your grace. Receive this offering of worship, O God, as we celebrate your goodness and your glory. Hear our songs of praise, O God. Take delight in our glad adoration. Please be seated. Like a father who gives good gifts to his children, God eagerly extends forgiveness to each little one who asks. So let us humbly pray for God's grace and mercy, reading together our prayer of confession, reading it thoughtfully, followed by a time of personal silent confession. Let us pray. When we have tried to live apart from you, O oh God, we have been like trees planted in a desert or sojourners in a dry and desolate land. When we have tried to live apart from you and have depended on our own strength and wisdom, we have come to know our own frailty and our weakness. We return to you now hoping that your faithfulness has endured our unfaithfulness and that you will receive us with grace and mercy. We come to you with confidence, O oh God, for we trust that you have come first to us through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, and that through him you have granted us the gift of new and abundant life.
Hear the good news. The statement is completely reliable that Christ Jesus entered the world to rescue sinners. He personally bore the sins of humankind on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now, as God's own people, be merciful in action, kindly in heart, humble in mind, and always be ready to forgive as freely as the Lord has forgiven you.
Thank you, Amy, for sharing your gift with us. Welcome to this time of worship as we gather together as a family and visitors of First Presbyterian Church to worship together. We hope all of you will sign the friendship pad so that we can have a record of you being here and also so the folks sitting around you can welcome one another following the service today. On the back of the bulletin, you'll see various announcements about activities going on in the life of the church. Hope you'll be involved as you can. A few announcements that are not printed in the bulletin. One, a reminder that we continue with our FPC Shares uh, project. Uh, every month, a different non-perishable food item that when you go to the grocery store to pick up a couple things for some of the, uh, those who hunger in our communities. For the month of July, it is, we're, we're still collecting powdered milk and uh, juices. And so if you uh, uh, are able to bring some of those, there are bins placed at different spots around the church, and then we get those to the various uh, uh, agencies here in town that respond to hunger needs. A couple of events coming up uh, that you're invited to participate uh, in to strengthen and nurture your own faith. Uh, one is uh, um, here fairly local, the other was in Montreat, but I commend them both to you. The one that's fairly local will take place in September, but it would be good to get your registrations in now. It's the Growing Together Day, uh, at, uh, which is uh, hosted by our presbytery, and it's held at Johnston Community College over in Smithfield. Lots of workshops and classes, both morning and afternoon sessions. A, a lot of different topics, a very good uh, faculty who will be teaching these conferences, and the keynote speaker or preacher for the day is uh, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, who's been the pastor at the Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago for the past 35 years, nationally recognized preacher and teacher. Uh, we encourage all incoming officers, elders and deacons, to go to this as a part of their officer training, but it's open not just to officers, open to anybody who would like to come and take one of these classes. And these uh, brochures are in the church office uh, and around various places, but you can also find out about, the, about this uh, online at the Presbytery's website. In just a couple of weeks, uh, from August 7 through 11 in Montreat, Sheila Barrick and Sarah Friday Peters are helping to lead a conference on the care of the body, care of the soul. Uh, it's a conference to give uh, folks resources for doing just that, uh, taking care of our physical body, but also taking care of our spiritual selves. Uh, the biblical understanding, of course, is that these two are combined, that to care for one is to care for the other and vice versa. But this gives resources for how to do that and how to incorporate that care of body and care of soul into your lives. But again, those dates are August 7 through 11, held at Montreat. This is the first time this conference has been offered. If you'd like to know more about that, you can uh, talk to Sheila directly because she's on the planning team for that conference. But again, we're grateful that you're here with us as we worship God together. There are a couple of people in um, care facilities. Margaret Edwards is at Rex Rehab, and Mary Bates Sherwood is at Western Wake. Let us turn to God in prayer. Holy God, we come to you in prayer today, trusting in your love and faithfulness. We come seeking your presence with us and finding our hope in you. You have blessed us in countless ways, in the beauty of the world about us, in sunshine and rainbows, in animal and plant life, in the beauty of a summer garden. We thank you that your world shows forth your goodness, and we remember those in lands where there is famine and drought, hunger and devastation. Help us to know how to harvest and share your bounty, for there are so many in our world who lack food, water, shelter, and the basic needs of life. Holy God, somehow help us to look beyond ourselves, beyond what we think we need and want, beyond our consumerism and materialism, our self-centeredness and our self-preservation, that we might share with others and make the world a more humane place. Forgive us, Lord, when we shut off the rest of the world and seek refuge in our comfortable cocoons. Wake us up and challenge us 
that we might become members of a worldwide community that genuinely works for peace and justice. Benevolent God, we do not want to hear all of the horrors that are in our world that go on all around us. It's so much easier to switch a channel or walk away or write a check. We don't want our children to be upset by these things or our youth to walk away. And we ourselves are good at turning our backs and rationalizing that there is nothing we can do. So Lord God, show us what we can do and what you'd have us do. Help us to reach out to the lonely and the forgotten, to the sick and suffering, to one another in our vulnerability, and to our sisters and our brothers in our community and worldwide. Stir our hearts as we pray together the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for the children to come forward and meet with me for a few minutes on the steps down here, if you like. We're the only ones that just get to sit on the floor, make ourselves comfortable. It's good to have you all today. I want to talk about prayer today. There was one time when the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And he did. Remember that? First thing he said was you start your prayer, our Father. So we can call God our Father, like a very nice Father who loves us and wants what's best for us and who won't yell at us. That's pretty good, right? You can... And the second part of that prayer was to remind ourselves that God is holy, God is very, very good, so we should try to be good. And the third part of that prayer is, please give us food so we won't be hungry. And the fourth part was, uh, forgive us for the bad things we did and help us forgive the people who made us mad. That's kind of hard to do sometimes. And then the last part was, and God, keep us out of trouble. <laughs> but you know, Jesus not only taught them how to pray, but he modeled it for them. He showed them how to pray. Anytime there was something important coming up, Jesus went off to pray. Or sometimes he would invite two or three of them to go with him, like James and John and Peter, to go up on the mountain to pray. Uh, so whenever something was important, he prayed. So I was wondering today if you could teach me to pray. For example, can you pray standing up or lying down? You can? So it's okay. You can pray any way you want to. Huh? Do you have to be in church to pray? You don't? Where do you pray? Anywhere. Where's one of your favorite places to pray? In your room. Yeah, that Bible says that. Go to your room and pray. That's a good thing to do. Can you sing a prayer? You know some prayers you can sing? Can you sing one? You know that one, the Lord's been good to me. And so I thank the Lord. You know that one? You don't sing that one. You didn't sing that for us. Come on. It's the Johnny Appleseed prayer, right? That kind of thing. Okay. Well, what shall we pray today? Can you teach me a prayer? What's a prayer that you know or something that you sing? What's a prayer you know? The one we just prayed, our Father who art in heaven, is that the rest? 
And we'll have to get a bed. I pray, Father, for this day, for our friends, for this food, we thank thee. That's a good prayer. Can you teach us? Come here. You lead us in prayer now. Okay, you just do it line by line, and we'll say it with you, okay? Okay. Okay, I'll do it the best I can remember. Okay, you want to pray with me? We'll say, try to say the prayer too. Okay, ready? Let's pray. Father, for this day, for our friends, and for our food, we thank thee. Amen. Okay. Easy to pray. Now, bring you back to your parents. Please join me now in a prayer for illumination. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from Psalms chapter 63, verses 1 through 8, and is a psalm of David where he praises the comfort and assurance of the presence of God while in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadows of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. This is the word of the Lord. From that psalm, which is one of the most heartfelt prayers in the Old Testament, we turn now to the New Testament, to Luke's record of the Gospel, where we find one of Jesus' teachings on prayer from the 11th chapter, the first 13 verses. Listen again to God's word for us. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. 
For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and everyone who knock, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, pour out your Spirit upon us as we gather here this day, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. When I graduated from high school several years ago now, quite a few years ago at that, there were four basic paths that were available to the young men and women from my graduating class. Many of us headed off to college because we grew up in families where that was expected of us. Some went to work right away, perhaps in family businesses. A few members of my class went directly into the military because in the Tidewater area of Virginia, the Navy and the Air Force were part of the fabric of everyday life. And while those three options were available to most high school graduates everywhere, because of where I grew up, there was one more option available to us that was somewhat unique. Because from every graduating class, from every high school in my area in Hampton, Virginia, a handful of people would end up at the apprentice school. The apprentice school at the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company, or as we called it, the shipyard. The shipyard was and is one of the largest producers of ocean-going vessels in the world, tankers and aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines. And the apprentice school is the place where one would go to learn to do the welding and the pipe fitting and the crane operating that were needed to build those large vessels. And as the name implies, the apprentice school didn't teach these trades by sitting young people down in classrooms and having them read books about welding and pipe fitting and crane operating. They taught these trades by putting young students in the presence of welders and pipe fitters and crane operators so that they could watch people who had mastered these crafts, so they could learn the techniques and the art of the trade. Now I could read every book that's ever been published on welding, and I'm not sure I would know how to put a perfect seam between two pieces of metal. But if you watched a master welder at work, and then if that master welder handed you the touch, the torch, and then guided you as you had your beginnings, and if you spent weeks and weeks and months and months trying to emulate what you had seen with this master welder, you could become a welder. And that's what they did at the apprentice school. They put aspiring craftsmen in the company of experts so that they could learn the techniques of the trade. Ideally, though, what happens in this process is that the student moves past the mechanical repetition of moving from step one, step two, and step three, so that technique gives way to artistry as it becomes a natural part of who they are so that they, become, they weld without thinking about step one, step two, and step three. They simply do what has become almost natural to them. Or to move from the apprentice school analogy, think about how people learn to dance. Now, I've never been to dancing school. If you saw me on a dance floor, you'd be surprised at that, that I've never been to dancing school. So I technically don't know how they teach people to dance, but I've seen sort of the caricature of how you teach people to dance. You put those cut out feet with numbers on a floor and you tell the student to step here, then here, then here, then here, then again, here, then here, then here, then here. 
But it's possible, I would imagine, to leave such a lesson knowing the steps but not knowing how to dance. For at some point, to move from knowing the steps to knowing how to dance, the steps have to become your steps. The rhythm of the dance has to come from within you, a natural extension of who you are. Otherwise, you would step out on the dance floor, and seeing no cut-out feet on the floor, you wouldn't know what to do. Well, what I want to suggest this morning is that when the disciples come to Jesus and ask Him to teach them to pray, it's because they've seen Him pray. It's because they've seen that His prayers are qualitatively different than their prayers and the prayers of everyone else they've ever seen. That his prayers are deeper, richer, more powerful than their prayers. And so they want to be his apprentices. They want to learn from him. They want him to guide them so that their prayers will take on some of the depth and the richness that they see in his. But we miss the point of this passage when we think this only has to do with the technique of prayer. So that once we have the Lord's Prayer memorized, we know how to pray. For when the disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray, they weren't asking for a new prayer to memorize, as if the rote repetition of a prayer was what was missing in their lives. No, when they said to Jesus, will you teach us to pray? What they were really saying to Jesus was, can you help us get closer to God? That, I think, is the question behind the question. They weren't saying, Jesus, can you give us the ABCs of prayer so that we'll know the proper technique, the proper steps of prayer. Instead, I think they were saying, Jesus, can you help us satisfy our hunger for God? Can you help us learn to spend time in God's presence and experience God's goodness? Now, we modern people, on the other hand, we tend to settle for learning the techniques. We like how-to books, but some things can't be reduced to a technique. Some things, just because you know how to do steps one, two, and three, that doesn't mean you really know what you're doing. Just because you've learned the mechanics of something doesn't mean you've gained a mastery of it. Of course, maybe I'm giving the disciples too much credit here. Maybe their question was really more superficial than I'm suggesting. Maybe what their question really meant was, Jesus, teach us how to pray so that God will give us what we want. Teach us how to pray so that our prayers work. We'd like to know that secret too, wouldn't we? If there was a proper technique, a right formula, if there was some secret word we could use that would really get God's attention so that God would give us what we want, when we want it, that'd be pretty great, wouldn't it? And, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's such a book out there, a how-to book on how to pray so you can get what you want now. But that's not what Jesus gives us here. He's not giving us a prayer to recite from memory so that we'll never have to think about prayer again. Neither is he giving us a technique for praying that will cause us to move to the front of God's line. Instead, Jesus is inviting us here to enter into a relationship with God, a sacred relationship where we persistently seek after God and where we trust that God in his love for us will give us just what we need at just the right time. I read not long ago that when aspiring monks wanted to go to a certain monastery, it was not unusual for them to go to the door of the monastery and knock and then to wait. Sometimes for as long as two weeks, sitting there on the ledge of the monastery, waiting for the door to open, waiting to be let in. What the monks on the inside knew was that sometimes on a whim, people would think they needed to go to the monastery. Maybe they were having a bad day at work. 
Maybe their girlfriend just broke up with them. Who knows why someone thinks they need to go to the monastery? And so the monks on the inside didn't always answer the door right away. They wanted to see who was serious about this calling. They wanted to know if the person out there was willing to keep knocking, keep asking, keep wanting to come in. I don't know if prayer actually works like this, but sometimes it feels like it does. And Jesus tells us here to be persistent in our praying, to keep knocking, to keep calling out to God, even when it seems we have reached a dead end and a locked door. The truth about this, however, is that even great persistence in prayer doesn't guarantee that your prayers will be answered just the way you want them answered. But it does keep us turned in the direction of God. It does keep us oriented toward God, which is why we pray in the first place. Someone once suggested to me that prayer is like being on a boat that is anchored to a rock. When you first begin to pull on the line that's connected to the rock, you might think that you're pulling the rock to you. But what you discover after a while is you're really pulling yourself to the rock. When we first begin to pray, when we first learn to pray, what we think we want more than anything else is to bend God to, to, to to our will, to pull God in our direction. But what we learn over time is that our prayers are really about bending us toward God so that our prayers become less and less about what we want and more and more about what God wants. Less and less about what we want for ourselves and more and more about what God wants for us. I've also heard it suggested that God has three basic answers to our prayers. And I bet you've gotten all three of these answers. Here they are. Yes. No. And this is the one we get most of all. We'll see. A few years ago in the movie Bruce Almighty, we saw the chaos that would ensue if God gave us all what we want all the time. In the movie, Bruce, the character, was given the power of God for a few days to see what it's like to be God, which means that he had to respond to all the prayers in the world. And in the movie, it's a modern movie, all the prayers of the world came into his email inbox. And it was overwhelming, thousands a day, hundreds of thousands a day, millions a day. And so rather than give careful attention to each one, he thought it would simply be easier just to give everybody what they wanted, which was a catastrophe. For not everyone can have everything they want. For two people might be praying for opposite things to happen. Think about the last time you watched a Duke Carolina game. Or a neighbor might look out at their parched lawn and pray for rain, whereas two doors down, these neighbors are planning a family cookout. They're praying for clear skies. They are not both going to get yes today. And only God is wise enough to sort that out. And so a wise prayer will bring their prayers to God, but then they will yield to God's wisdom, saying as Jesus did, not my will, but thy will be done. And ironically, sometimes our prayers are answered even if not in the way we would have chosen. I don't know if you know much about Augustine, the bishop of the early church whose writings were so influential to John Calvin and Martin Luther. What is almost hard to imagine about Augustine, because we think of him as this great learned scholar, is that he at one time in his life was a teenage boy whose mother worried about him. Augustine's mother, her name was Monica, was a devout Christian. 
His father, whose name escapes me, was not. And Monica was worried that Augustine showed more of an inclination to follow his father than to follow her. And she was particularly worried that her son seemed determined to leave their home in North Africa and head for Italy, where he wanted to pursue his scholarly and artistic interests. Monica feared that if he left for Italy, if he was anywhere beyond her reach, that any chance of him becoming a Christian believer would be lost. And so her most fervent prayer for the longest time was that he not go to Italy. But he did. For his chief ambition was to study his chosen discipline of rhetoric. And so he traveled to Milan, a place of great culture and temptation. And when he got there, he asked around about where he might study rhetoric. And person after person told him, if you want to study rhetoric, you need to go to the cathedral on Sundays to hear Bishop Ambrose speak, for he is the greatest practitioner of rhetoric in all of Italy. You don't have to believe what he says, they told him, but you will marvel at the power of his words. And so he went, Sunday after Sunday, and even though he was there just to listen to the way the bishop crafted his arguments, what began to happen was that the power of the bishop's preaching began to sink into Augustine's heart. The gospel of Jesus Christ began to take root in him, and thus began the transformation that led Augustine to become one of the greatest Christian thinkers the world has ever known. Now, Monica's prayers were not answered in the way that she wanted them answered. She wanted her son to stay in North Africa and to become a Christian. But God knew that she could have one or the other, but she couldn't have both. He could stay in North Africa, but then he would never be exposed to Ambrose and thus never perhaps be persuaded of the Christian gospel. Or he could leave North Africa and discover the very thing that she wanted most to give him. The irony is that had she gotten her way, her deepest prayer would never have been answered. The irony is that while it must have seemed to her that she was knocking on an unresponsive door, God was at work with an answer that exceeded her wildest imagination. Teach us to pray, the disciples said to Jesus. This was more than a request to learn the techniques of prayer. The disciples wanted to learn to connect to God, to relate to God, to dwell in God's presence the way they saw Jesus dwell in God's presence. Perhaps you do too. If you do, Jesus invites you first and foremost to be persistent in your praying to keep at it, even if it seems to you that no one is listening, to keep at it, to keep your side of the conversation going, whether you get results or not. For the truth is that our praying is not about getting results. Our praying is not about getting what we want when we want it. Our Praying is about bowing in the direction of God and saying, thank you and forgive me and help. Our praying is more than reciting a few words from memory. Our praying is about placing our deepest yearnings, our deepest fears, our deepest hopes at the feet of God and then stepping back and trusting God to be God. To God be the glory. 
now and forevermore. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us now present unto God our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all your many blessings, and we now offer to you a portion of that which you have given to us. Please use it to further your kingdom. Amen. Jesus says, keep asking and seeking and knocking. Live your life oriented toward God and take the deepest yearnings of your heart to God. But trust and believe this, that God knows our needs long before we ask. And in the gift of Jesus Christ, God has already answered our deepest prayers. Our prayers for life and hope and joy everlasting. And now may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessings of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and abide with you, with all those you love, and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen.